an unemployed drifter from Colorado, called George Nada, travels across America in search of a place in the sun. This is how he ends up in Los Angeles with its tall skyscrapers and great opportunities. The man comes to a job center to find an official job. A lot of people, who are also looking for work, have gathered there. George has an interview and tells a job center worker about his difficult fate. In his hometown, many businesses all closed at once, and people were left without work. The woman listens to George without much interest and says that he doesn't have enough experience to be employed. The man gives a disappointed smile and leaves the job center. As he continues aimlessly wandering the streets of the city, George stumbles upon a preacher and stops to listen to him speak. The preacher emotionally tells a small group of bystanders that demons have captured the minds of the ruling class of the earth and control ordinary people through them. The man urges the listeners to wake up and escape the control of the ruling elites. Noticing the police car, Nada decides to walk on. Along the way, he sees a strange man who, as if hypnotized, is watching a meaningless advertisement on the TV behind the store glass. But Nada doesn't pay too much attention to him and wanders on. Eventually, George finds a temporary center for the homeless and plans to spend the night there. A woman in the house next door is mesmerized by a TV show about a narcissistic star who believes they will never grow old. George is tired, so he leans back in his chair and sighs heavily, immersed in his thoughts. The following day, George visits a construction site and tries to get a job there as a laborer. At first, the foreman refuses to take Nada, because they only allow workers who are a part of the trade union. However, George looks convincing, so the foreman negotiates the salary and hires him. Like everyone else, the man begins to work in the sweat of his brow. Although the issue of his employment has been resolved, he will only be able to get the money in a few days, so he has nowhere to spend the night once again. One of the workers, named Frank, notices the frustrated rookie and offers to show him a place with food and a warm shower. At first, Nada is distrustful of his new acquaintance, but soon decides to follow him. Along the way, the men manage to find something to talk about and bond over. Frank brings the drifter to a camp and introduces him to friendly locals who have come to Los Angeles in search of fortune from all over the world. It is customary here to help each other, even children feel comfortable in this camp. One of the local men named Gilbert immediately gives George a task to make the camp cozier. It is time to have lunch, and George is given a large portion of hearty food. During the meal, Frank tells George about his life. Just like George, he moved to another city to find work to be able to provide for his family, who remained in Detroit. Frank is angry at the local elite who have lined their pockets with money and closed nearly every factory in his hometown, putting hundreds of people out of work. The man has already lost all his patience, and he is ready for drastic measures if at least one more plant closes. Frank believes that the lower classes have to fight to survive, so he friendly warns George that he's ready to compete with him for a place in the sun. George is more optimistic. He is set on working hard and building his life from scratch. In the evening, Nada is walking around the camp and notices some locals enthusiastically watching a TV commercial about false nails. At some point, the signal is interrupted, and a broadcast with an anxious man appears on the screen. He talks about how they all live in an artificially created world. According to him, a group of scientists managed to discover that some unknown creatures send a special signal to Earth that puts people in a trance and deprives them of critical thinking. There are more and more poor people, and racial injustice is on the rise. The aliens brainwashed people to be indifferent to everything except their own benefit. However, the residents dismiss the alarming message of the weirdo on the TV. They only complain about their headaches and change the channel with the broadcast. George notices that a blind priest is standing near the group repeating every word from the broadcast. Gilbert immediately runs up to the priest. George can't hear their exchange, but figures that the men are having an argument. In a hurry, Gilbert leads the old man towards the church, located on the camp territory. George's eyes follow the retreating men for a little longer, and he suspects that they have some kind of secret. The following morning, Nada meets Gilbert by the camp entrance and decides to ask about his nightly trip to the church. The man says that the church provides a communal kitchen for the homeless, and he had to stay there overnight to put everything in order. On top of that, Gilbert informs him that he sings in the church choir, and the rehearsal is about to start. The same broadcast with the mysterious man appears on the TV again, and he urges to stop the transmission of the signal hypnotizing people immediately. The broadcast induces severe headaches again, and the residents breathe a sigh of relief when the TV switches back to the baseball game. Anxious, Gilbert hurries to the church again, and this time George decides to follow him. He can indeed hear the choir singing in the church, so he assumes he won't arouse any suspicion by going inside. In the church, he discovers a chemical mini laboratory and a mysterious inscription on the wall, they live, we sleep. The man notices a tape recorder, which is loudly playing the singing of the choir. It only serves as a cover to drown out the noises of the secret meeting that is taking place behind the wall. In the next room, Gilbert, the man from the TV, 
and other members of the secret group are trying to hack the channel once again to play their recording for a longer time and reach more viewers. The members of the group want to recruit as many people as possible to communicate their ideas to the society more effectively and efficiently. Hearing their conversation, George backs away and accidentally stumbles upon a secret vault with an abundance of boxes. He decides to leave this mystery for later, closes the vault and is about to leave when he stumbles upon the blind priest. The priest feels his face and hands and then releases George. He realizes that George is the laborer, and immediately, with no hesitation, starts talking about the revolution. George is disturbed by all of this, and he runs out of the church. The preacher yells after the guy that he will eventually come back. A police helicopter appears and begins to circle over the church, which makes the attendees of the meeting nervous. Soon the helicopter flies away, and George borrows binoculars from a local teenager and continuously monitors what is happening in the building. Gilbert and his henchmen carry boxes out of the building and put them in the car. George's surveillance is interrupted by Frank. Nada immediately tells his friend about what he just saw in the church, but Frank doesn't want to get into trouble and advises him not to interfere with whatever is going on either. Meanwhile, the car filled with the boxes pulls away from the church. George watches the church with the binoculars all day, but nothing else happens. In the evening, the camp and the church are surrounded by the police. The people are confused about what exactly they are guilty of, so they silently observe what is going on. Suddenly, the police, with the help of bulldozers, begin to demolish the numerous tents and trailers of the residents, and they scatter in a panic. Horrified, George watches the chaos unfolding as the police ruthlessly destroy the lives of good people. Law enforcement officers catch and corner the priest and the preacher from the TV. They desperately try to resist, but the police beat them till they no longer breathe. The same fate awaits everyone who doesn't escape from the camp. George can't do anything to help those who have already been taken by the police, but he saves a teenager who is huddled in a corner in fear. Having barely escaped from the police, George and the frightened teenager climb onto the top floor of a dilapidated church. After wandering through the corridors, they find a room where the remaining survivors are hiding. The people don't understand why they were raided and spend the whole night in a shelter. In the morning, they come out of their hiding spot to inspect what is left of the camp after the last night's nightmare. The camp looks like a hurricane went through it, but they find a TV in the middle of the camp, which surprisingly still works and is broadcasting funny ads. Meanwhile, George decides to investigate the secret vault in the church. The provocative inscription on the wall next to him was covered up during yesterday's raid. George finds one surviving box in the pantry, the same as those that Gilbert hurried away yesterday in the car. Immediately, a patrol car drives past the church, and George is forced to hide from law enforcement officers. After he found a safe space, the man opens the box and is disappointed to find dozens of sunglasses inside. He hides the box in a trash can and takes one pair of glasses with him. As he walks around the city, George decides to put on his glasses, and everything around him suddenly turns black and white. The whole, previously so familiar, world takes on a completely different look. Through the glasses, every billboard, sign or headline reads, Obey, Marry, Breed, Consume, Buy, Don't Think, Watch TV, and so on. Instead of glossy pictures in magazines, he sees a set of manipulative phrases and calls for submission. Even people who previously seemed ordinary now show their true monstrous face through the glasses. He takes them off and puts them back on several times to make sure the man standing in front of him really looks like an alien creature. The strange man watches George suspiciously, but fortunately doesn't say or do anything. Once again, George puts the glasses on and sees the inscription This is your God on the banknotes. He also discovers that there are transmitters installed at every traffic light in the city that broadcast a hypnotizing voice. It says the order over and over again, sleep. Nada soon realizes that not all people are the same. Amazed, he watches ordinary humans calmly communicate with those who look like alien monsters. And it immediately becomes clear that monsters are the most successful in the society. Entering the supermarket, George pays attention to a politician's speech on the TV, and an alien is also hiding behind his face. The guy begins to laugh hysterically at this revelation. He can't help but insult the lady pushing him, who also looks like a monster through the glasses. He tries to explain to the ordinary people around him that this is a monster standing in front of them. But by doing so he only blows his cover. The lady informs other aliens about a person who can see their real appearance through the walkie-talkie in her wristwatch and describes his appearance. Having received the message, the other aliens move towards him. George runs out into the street, horrified. Here, many aliens are looking intently at him but the man doesn't notice them and insults the monster woman. He is then immediately caught by the fake police. They interrogate George and ask him where he got the glasses, but the guy doesn't tell. Then, the guards threaten him and try to convince him to join them. However, George doesn't give in so easily. He beats the law enforcement officers, grabs their weapons and gets rid of them. Police cars immediately begin to arrive at the scene. Armed, George decides to hide in the bank. There, 
he discovers that half of the visitors are aliens as well. Driven by the adrenaline, the guy opens fire on aliens who are hiding under the guise of people. One of the aliens calls another squad of police and magically disappears before George can shoot him. In an attempt to escape from the alien pursuers, he runs out of the bank and notices a drone following him. George knocks it down and then goes to a closed parking lot where he meets a pretty girl named Holly. He makes sure that she is human, takes the girl hostage and orders her to take him to her house. This is the only way for him to escape from his pursuers, who are rushing to the bank. At Holly's house, George falls to the floor, exhausted, and tries to explain the reason for his actions. He apologizes to the girl for the inconvenience caused. He tells her that their world is in danger and that the power has been seized by evil creatures that control everyone around them. George invites Holly to put the sunglasses on and see for herself, but the girl refuses and doesn't believe him. When the man closes his eyes in exhaustion, Holly tries to walk quietly past him, but he watches her every move. After a while, George calms down and asks his hostage what she does. Holly reveals that she works as an assistant director in television. George remembers that the aliens are sending their signal through the TV and wants to break it. As soon as the guy loses his guard, the girl breaks the bottle on his head and pushes him out of the window. After falling from the second floor, George miraculously survives, but loses his sunglasses. Meanwhile, Holly informs the police about what happened and calls a police squad to her address. Nada is forced to hide from the guards again and finds a safe spot under the bridge. After dark, the guy reaches another neighborhood and spends the night in the street. The next day, he comes to the construction site to ask for Frank's help to fight against the alien creatures. His friend is terrified of him, as George just staged a massive shooting and eliminated a lot of people. George tries to tell Frank that they weren't people, but aliens in disguise, however he doesn't want to listen to anything George is saying and tells him to go away. Then, George comes to the place where he hid the box full of sunglasses, but all the trash cans are empty. The man sees a garbage truck parked nearby. He climbs into the back of the truck and, rummaging through the garbage, finds a few surviving pairs of glasses. Frank becomes an accidental witness to George's trash adventures. Frank gives his friend his salary and says that he can't help him anymore. George insistently asks his friend to put the glasses on, so he can see the real world too. But Frank refuses and believes that his friend has gone crazy. Tired of distrust, George decides to punch his friend, and a fierce fight ensues between them. In the end, Nada kicks his friend to the ground and forces the glasses on him. Amazed, Frank finally believes George, horrified by the reality. The friends rent a room at a nearby motel, where they discuss their next course of action. Frank assumes that there are other people who see the aliens, and they must look for them. George tells him a story from his childhood. Living in dire poverty, he was constantly abused by his father. Severe class inequality caused hatred in ordinary people, which fueled the aliens all these years. Now George intends to take revenge on them for his broken life. In the morning, the friends meet Gilbert at the motel, who is also wearing sunglasses. He invites them to a secret meeting of like-minded people, which is taking place that evening. The friends arrive at the address and meet other seers of different ages. They exchange the sunglasses for modern lenses that are safer for the eyes and give a clearer picture. Gilbert tells them in detail about who these creatures that flooded the earth are. It turns out that the alien invaders are recruiting ordinary humans for their own purposes, promising them wealth and power in return for their faithful service. For them, the earth is just a business and a temporary source of resources for the creation of the third world. All global catastrophes and climate change are also their work. When the aliens completely exhaust the earth, they will move on to enslave new planets. One of the members of the resistance unit shows Frank the alien watch, which he decides to take. The protesters have not been able to crack the secret code on the alien device, which allows them to move in space freely and talk to each other. Gilbert gathers everyone and says that they still don't have enough men for a massive attack. But the group is belligerent and assures that action must be taken immediately. Gilbert calms the crowd and suggests that they first should find the source of the signal and hack it to wake people out of their trance. Holly appears in the room and gives a clue on where the signal might be. She nervously fiddles with George's sunglasses and apologizes to him for what she did. Their conversation is interrupted by the sudden appearance of the police, who open fire on the group. Most of the resistance members were lost while trying to escape, but George, Frank and Holly managed to escape the building unscathed. Armed to the teeth, the friends shoot back at the aliens and hide in a street alley. George wants to go to the very epicenter of the massacre to find Holly, but Frank stops him from executing his dangerous idea. He tries to figure out how the watch works, so they could intercept aliens communication, but instead unexpectedly opens another worldly portal. The cops are getting closer and closer to the friend's hideout, so they have no choice but to jump into the portal. They end up in an underground alien base, where they find writings in an unknown language. The friends carefully move along a corridor and stumble upon an alien checkpoint. The creatures in the guise of military personnel are reported on the radio that the operation to eliminate the terrorist group has been successfully completed. Satisfied, 
the aliens leave to celebrate the victory, and Frank and George move towards the sounds coming from the end of the corridor. They end up at a gala banquet where a man in an expensive suit delivers a praising speech for the alien alliance. He gleefully informs the recruited guests that the aliens will soon completely take over the Earth, which will bring huge benefits to the elite of humankind. Then he shares the statistics of their success with the audience, which causes universal delight and applause. The friends are approached by one of the former residents of the camp, who also took the side of the invaders. He decides that George and Frank have also been recruited by the aliens and is surprised that they are still dressed as poor people. The man decides to give the recruits a tour of the base and leads them to an alien airport. There, the aliens in human form go on trips to other planets in the universe. Then they reach the backstage of the television studio, where the control center of the entire operation is located. Through the satellite, the signal is transmitted around the world, enslaving the consciousness of ordinary humans. Through flattery, George tricks their tour guide into taking them inside the television studio itself. The man agrees, but the guards refuse to let them through without a special pass. Then the guys decide to use force and shoot the aliens. Their old acquaintance tries to stop them and convince them to submit to the new authority. The aliens have enslaved the entire planet and control every action of the humans. He invites them to join the victors and enjoy the benefits that the aliens give them for their faithful service. Despite his arguments, the guys don't intend on becoming traitors. One of the soldiers breaks into the room, and the traitor uses this moment to move in space. The friends take their weapons and break through the studio into the main office, where recruited humans are working. George interrogates the employees, trying to find Holly with their help, but no one knows where she is. However, he learns that the signal that hypnotizes people is located on the roof. The friends immediately go to the top of the building and meet Holly along the way, who managed to survive. Shooting at the aliens, the trio finally rises to the top floor, but Holly turns out to be a traitor and mercilessly shoots Frank in the head before entering the rooftop. George finds a satellite dish broadcasting the alien signal and aims to shoot at it. But the girl quietly approaches him from behind and tells him to surrender, pointing a weapon at him. He refuses and shoots Holly first. He then destroys the satellite dish. Helicopters immediately open fire on George, but, as he is leaving the world, he mockingly shows the aliens his middle finger. George manages to break the signal and humanity finally learns the shocking truth about the reality. Now all of them can see that alien creatures have been hiding among ordinary humans, broadcasting television shows, going to the same establishments as them, acting in films and even starting relationships. Thanks to a simple drifter from Colorado, the world was able to wake up from a long sleep.